First thing I want to talk about is something a little bit different from what's next in the book, which is page 123, which is chapter on time and its importance, because the all, all important people, everyone who wants to achieve something in life, focuses on the subject of time. But the Sufiya in particular give a lot of emphasis on the subject matter. But before this, I want to talk about another critical, critical subject, which is al hidayatu wa husuliha. Hidayah, guidance, and how to obtain it. Firstly, simple question, what is guidance? Okay, what is guidance? Guidance is that your body and your heart are in line with the divine will. That your, bo your limbs and your qalb, all right? Sterling, you can sit in here too if you want. Your limbs and your heart are in line with the divine will, okay? This ultimately is Hidayah. And if you can imagine an orbit, okay? Uh, planets are orbit orbiting around their sun. Moons are orbiting around their planet, okay? Everything in space is orbiting perfectly. You don't see crash accidents in, in space. You don't see the moon being, you know, uh, question, questionable. The moon is never questionable. The sun is never questionable. It's predictable. Everything is running perfectly. If it wasn't predictable, if it wasn't moving perfectly, we would have chaos on the earth. Okay? So, Hidayah is that we are operating in the orbit that we're supposed to be in as human beings. Okay? And the difference is that the planets and the moon, they're yani, uh, very simple. Our lives are much more complex, okay? But uh, we're in our orbit so long as we're not doing what we're not supposed to be doing and we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, okay? And our heart is in the position that it's supposed to be in. Now, this, no human being by himself can do, can get this, and be like this by himself. A person is only guided because Allah is preserving him. All right. Can the sun be doing what it's doing by itself? All right? Can the moon be doing what it's doing by itself? No. Only Allah Azza wa is holding them in place. So how do we get to hold ourselves in place? We can't do it ourselves. We can only do it if Allah is preserving us. Okay? This is why the NBA are ma'asoon and the awliya are mahfuz. The anbiya cannot do wrong. Okay? And the awliya are protected from wrong. Of course, the big difference being that someone mahfuz, he can at some point in his life do something wrong or in his past, but the awliya are mahfuz, protected. Hidayah is the most valuable thing in the creation of the universe. Okay? It's the most valuable thing in the creation of the universe. Okay? Why is that? What is more valuable? You're to, to be alive or to be guided? What is the value of life if you're alive but not guided? You're in hellfire. And what do those people on the way say in Surah Naba? Ya laytani kuntu turaba. I wish that I was just dirt. If I was a rock, it would be better off for me than to be dragged to hell. So, Hidayah is more valuable than life. It's more valuable to us than our own life. But what is the value of Hidayah? Its value is eternal paradise. That's the value of it. 
look at this. In this life, if you will attain Hidayah just for two breaths, for two breaths before your death, you're guaranteed paradise for an eternity. So Hidayah, closing out your life with Hidayah, with guidance, is equal. That small bit of Hidayah, guidance, is equal to an eternity of paradise. Now, we now come to the question of if Hidayah is only from Allah Azza wa Jal, and only by Allah that people are guided, then how do we earn it? You can't do it yourself, but you can earn it. How do you earn it? Okay, and this is the mistake many people make. Many people make this mistake. They imagine that one or two deeds that they can do, or that there's a specific dhikr, or there's a specific action that they can do to attain hidayah. You're wrong. The only thing that will gain you hidayah is what they call a siddhu fit talab. Siddhq, sincerity in wanting it. The only cardinal sin that you can do that will guarantee you that you're not going to receive hidayah, okay, is giving up. Giving up is the only wrong that you can do in this matter. The one who is seeking hidayah, he can, and most likely we all do, commit wrongs. Bad wrongs, major wrongs, pro big problems. We want hidayah, and that should be our goal. But we have baggage, we have issues, our hearts are still attached to dunya. Our heart, we have ego problems, we have so many problems. There's only one way to attain this hidayah, and that is to sincerely want it. And there's only one way to guarantee you're not going to get it, and that is to give up. To give up. This is why the first hikmah, he says, in the hikam ibn Atta, is when he says, oh, actually, this is out of order. But he says, uh, the, the one hikmah is, if you think that you're going to gain guidance by yourself, that's your first problem. You're not going to get it from yourself. Okay? Now, there's a parable that the ulama give. There's a parable. Okay? That there's a ship, one of the greatest ships, okay? The greatest ship of the time. And these sailors, they go around, they collect, uh, go to islands, and they collect whatever they collect from there. And this ship survives everything, and it's like paradise. The ship is perfect. Now, the captain, he's getting old. This is back in the day when they lived two, three hundred years. The captain's getting old. He needs to assign the next person to, to be the captain of the ship. Okay. So what does he do? He doesn't interview them. He doesn't give it to the first mate. He does not give it to the best worker on the ship. But rather, he tells everyone, we're going on a mission. Just a short mission. But it's a very bad place. So go do the job really quick and wait until I call you back. Okay? And he goes, gets onto the beach, but he doesn't take them to a bad island. He takes them to a gorgeous island, a big, huge country. And he takes them there, and then in the middle of the night while everyone's sleeping, he goes up to the mountain and he watches. Okay? He watches them from the top of the mountain. The first day, month, everyone is just pitching their tent on the beach and waiting. Just do the job that they have to do and wait. Just came waiting for the, for the captain to come back, say all aboard on the ship. But he doesn't come back. So they just get tired of waiting. Okay? So they start going, peeking into the island a little bit. Go in a little bit, take a peek, and come back. Well, by the second month, they're taking a peek, spending all day in the island, and coming back only at night. Well, by the third month, they're going in and spending the night in the island and only coming back once a week to check if the ship has been boarded or not. Well, by the end of the first year, they've totally forgotten about the ship. And they're taken by all the new things that they see on this island. They're taken, okay? 
and they go deep into the country until the ship and its captain are a mere memory. Ship and its captain are a mere memory. Okay? At that point, the captain waits to who see who is going to come back. Who is trying to come back? All right? Who's talking about the ship? Who even remembers the ship? Until finally, someone, the one, the first one, the ones who make it back, okay, are the ones who become the captains of the next ship. Why? Because the lesson isn't that you need to be the best person at running a ship. You need to want it the most. That is what Hidayah goes to. Allah Azza wa Jalla is not looking at the best Muslim now. Who's the best Muslim now? He's not looking at that. Who wants it the most? And so as soon, okay, as soon as someone gets a taste of Hidayah, they should expect a test to be thrown at them. And some of the tests are very hard. Some of the tests, the one of the hardest one is the mild one that lasts a long time. This is actually the hardest one. If someone puts a gun to your head at this minute and says, you want it or not, that's actually not a hard test. You know you're being tested. You know it's going to be two minutes or either you pass or fail really quickly. That's not a problem. The big problem is the long distance. I mean, what's harder to do, like a 400 millimeter or 400 meter dash or a marathon, right? The dash, you're either fast or you're not. But the marathon takes a lot of training. And Allah Azza wa Jal oftentimes puts us in three, four, five, ten year tests. We have to understand this, right? Sometimes a test is four, five, six, seven years, and we're just not able to get our hidayah. He is just waiting. Are you going to give up or not? Are you going to give up or not? And the test of Allah Azza wa Jal, as Ali bin Abi Talib said, okay, has a time limit. Kullu shay'in indahu bi biqdar. Everything, every test that Allah gives a person has a time limit. All you have to do is pass the test. Wait out the time, time limit. And so an individual will put 100% effort to attain ma'rif of Allah, to draw near to Allah, to change. And yet Allah will not grant it to him. He will continue making him do the same sins, allowing him to fall in the same sins. Okay? And he will regroup himself again and do another push and put a thousand percent effort and do everything the Quran says everything the shaykh says still he's not getting it still he's faltering he's not reaching it alright Allah Azza wa Jal is not testing whether or not you can do it he's testing how bad you want it you're going to fail once twice I'm waiting when are you going to give up the only sin that you can do that will cause you not to have hidayah is to give up. If you give up, you're finished. And I'm telling you, subhanAllah, you see some people, the best of us, there have been the best of us, and they gave up. SubhanAllah, they gave up. They didn't want it bad enough. You have to want it. And this is why all of the ulama of tasawwuf, they will tell you there's one way to attain the promised land, spiritual promised land that we're all seeking. Some of you have only heard about it. Some of you have seen it and then lost it. Some of you have climbed a mountain, looked, and then fell again. The only way that you will reside in that level that we're all talking about and is being described here is through one way, and that is a siddiq fi talab. It may take two years, one year, 20 minutes, or 20 years. Okay? You have to want it. And this Allah only grants it to those who have proven that they want it. Otherwise, it's going to be squandered. And why isn't it going to be squandered? This guidance is more valuable. Okay? The value of guidance is an eternity in paradise. That's the value of it. So he will not give it to someone who will squander it. The one who will squander it is not the one with the best safe. All right? The one who won't squander it is not the one with the best safe. The best lock, it's the one with the most stubbornness, persistency, okay? Stubborn, persistent, and faithful, believing you're going to get it. It's just a matter of time. And uh, subhanAllah, there have been some murids, okay? 33 years, he describes. Some murids, 40 years, describing that he is just a routine, run-of-the-mill murid. He does good some days, he does bad some days. He does good some days, he does bad some days. 
and he's just watching other people advance all his whole life. Finally, Allah Zawajal gave it to him. And when you get this hidayah, you don't know what happened to yourself. All of a sudden, everything that you feared that you were doing that you can't stop doing, all of a sudden, is gone. You don't even think about it anymore. Something, one or two little decisions that you made, it's as if Allah Azza wa Jal took a flash drive and dragged the, the virus from your hard drive to a flash drive and put the tra flash, took the flash drive out and threw it in the garbage. That's how, it's just all of a sudden, some light bulb went off. This is why the awliya always tell us, it's not from us. I don't know what happened, it's just, it's off. And something else turned on, that's it. SubhanAllah, this, this is a sign that something is from Allah. Can't explain how it happened. Okay. Now, that was a little yeah, any tangential thing that I want to share, which is essence of tasawwuf. Essence of tasawwuf, as siddiqu fi talab. And if you want to know, what is the nature of this happiness? We don't understand, you don't understand, what is this hidayah? You don't get it. One of the examples that they give is to look at the life and the state of a child. The state of a child. The state of a child is always in happiness. Okay. The state of a child is just carefree. The state of a child, there is no ego. There is no dunya. There is no nafs. They don't, children don't have envy. Like we're talking three and four years old. They don't have envy. They don't have all these things. They're pure and they're happy. Okay. And this is what we got to be looking at. If someone doesn't have a clue, what is this state that we're talking about? What is this guidance? Right? It's freedom from these shackles of sins. Sins are shackles keeping us down. Don't you want to be free from them? Right? So this is what this uh, state of Hidayah is all about. <clears throat> and then we look at the awliya. You look at how they lead their lives. How are they mountains like this? They're not, you know, faltering one way or the other. And they're the most happy of people. <clears throat> Okay, now to the hikmah of page 123 on time and its importance. Basically, the summary of this is every breath you take, you lose part of your life. Every time you inhale and exhale, part of your life is gone. Okay? So ask yourself, what part of my life just went? All right. Every time you breathe in and out, what part of your life just disappeared? Okay. What are you doing at that moment? Okay. And every action that you are doing, you should be able to justify it with knowledge from the religious law okay, or sunnah. Even your lahu. We have a couple of things. You have lahu and la'ib and jid. You have three categories. Jid, of course, means seriousness. That which is beneficial, that which is real. Okay? Then you have la'ib and lahu. And then uh, what's the other one? Um, yeah, la'ib and lahu. La'ib is something that is not real, but is building characteristics needed for what's real. So, um, for example, when kids are uh, playing certain games, let's say a kid is playing a math game, right? Way back in the day, there was math buckets, right? You gotta answer the equation before the little thing goes into the bucket. It's just a game, right? Or there's Carmen San Diego, geography game. Geography and general knowledge, right? So these are all games, right? But we say this live has an end. When you do this game a lot, you learn geography or you learn math. Or in certain sports that people do, you learn victory, you learn loss, you learn teamwork, you learn a lot of different things. Or you gain exercise. So there, it's meaningless in itself, but secondarily it has a benefit. This is laib. All right. Now what is lahu? Lahu is a type that is meaningless in itself, and is not preparing you for anything else. Is not preparing you for anything else. Like, let's take a comparison between someone who plays basketball. Well, you'd learn a lot of lessons in basketball. Firstly, you're keeping physically fit. 
Secondly, you're learning teamwork. You're learning how to win, how to lose, all these things. You're learning a lot, okay? Versus someone who is playing solitaire. It's just a game of meaninglessness. You don't learn anything, and there's no benefit at all there, okay? So it's a complete waste of time. This is the difference between la'ib and lahu. Now, what is the shara'i difference? La'ib has a place. La'ib has a place. La'ib is a tool, right? Games are tools of learning character things. So it has a place. Allahu is should be removed except in one circumstance when you are doing lahu with your family as this is the way to bond with one another. Okay? And this is a way of bonding between one another. Okay? And sometimes some families they don't get along. So what do they do? They have to do some lahu together. That's the only thing that will get them along. Okay, lahu. Like watching uh, TV together, watching the uh, Super Bowl together. Because you know, TV show turns off, two minutes a fight's gonna break out. So if you put the TV on, right? Then no fighting is gonna happen. So unfortunately, but lahu, the Prophet ﷺ said, with your family is the only time that Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't mind you doing lahu. Okay, if this is the way to get the family to be happy together. And of course, no, human beings all need downtime. So to do this with your family is accepted. To do it outside your family and your friends is not accepted. What was Jid? Jid is seriousness, that which is real. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, next one is... <clears throat> every state has a haq. Okay? لِكُلِّ مَقَامِ مَقَالِ Right? For every state that you're in, Okay, it has a haq. All right, being in the masjid is not like being at work. Being at work is not like being with your family. Being with your family is not like being with your parents, etc., so on and so forth. Everything is different. Everything has a haq. People have to know what is this the haq? What is the role of a man in his household? What is the role of the Prophet ﷺ in his household? Kana sallallahu alayhi wa sallam da'iman fi mihnati ahli. That the Prophet ﷺ, in his household, his sunnah, is that he takes the role of a servant of his family, okay? And the children take the servant of the parents, the role of servants to the parents. So the Prophet ﷺ, he is serving, if he's in the house of Aisha, even though he's much older than her, and he's the Prophet ﷺ. Aisha is asked, how is the Prophet when he's with you in the home? He says, he, he takes the role as if he is a servant. Cooking the bread, sweeping the floor, mending shoes, etc. Okay? Lifting uh, crumbs off the, the, the floor. This is the, how the Prophet spent his time as a default setting with his family. Okay? And the children in a family are also servants to the parents. Okay? So every position that you have, you have to know the sunnah of action in that position. And you cannot waste time, right? Do not waste time. Wastage of time is one of the biggest cardinal issues that Imam al-Ghazali talks about and Ahlul Tasawwuf talk about all the time. Every breath that you take, you have to ask, what position am I in and what is the haq of that position? If you're sick, the haq is sabr, right? It, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq made a big distinction, and Umar bin Khattab, they made a big distinction between day and night. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said, there is amal for Allah in the night, not acceptable in the day. And there is amal of the day, not acceptable at night. Okay, and what does he mean by this? The daytime is for khidmat al-ummah, service of the ummah. And the nighttime is for ibad of Allah. That we are not workaholics. In America, you have to know that America is not like the rest of the world. And usually, the number one greatest country in the world is a little bit different, and it has a problem. It, we are all workaholics. We are addicted to work. If you are sitting down for two minutes just relaxing, it's like something in the air will come and tell you you're wasting time. Right? If you're making dhikr, something will come and tell you you're wasting time. What should you be doing? Something economic, something that was productive, something that is going to get you a raise, something that's good for your resume. The drive is all materialistic for work. Well, Abu Bakr gives us a ruling. Work is for the day. 
In general, of course, Surah Al-Muzammil tells us that Allah knows some work is at night. But in general, work is for the day. And what's at night is for Allah. That means there should be a time where everything shuts off. And it used to be the norm. If you left the office, you can't, right? Unless you bring a file home with you. But now, it could be Sunday, 2 a.m. And you could be in your bedroom. But with technology, you could be doing work. You could be checking emails. You could be doing work. Well, we know, we have guidance. We have to shut this down, okay? Work has a time. And what is Abu Bakr, what did he consider work? Khilaf of the Ummah. The highest religious work is to be the Khalifa. Is there any function in the society better than to be the Khalifa of the Messenger of Allah? I mean, it's greater than being a brain surgeon, greater than being a heart surgeon. You're the Khalifa of Rasulullah. And yet he tells us there is a job, it's to be done in the day, it's not acceptable to do it at night. And at night, it's not acceptable if you do it in the day. Okay? Umar bin Khattab, of course, we all know his story. He was asked, he's the second Khalifa. He's the second one after the death of the Prophet to rule the Ummah. Okay? When do you sleep? He says, the Qailula of the night, of the afternoon. Well, why don't you sleep at night? How could I sleep at night when there's the Haqq of Allah? Right? And then they say, why don't you do it in the day? He said, how could I do it in the day? It's the Haqq of the Ibad. It's the right for the servants of Allah for me to serve them as their Khalifa. But when the night falls, they don't have the right for that anymore. It's Allah's time. And this is why they said, Fursanun bin nahar wa bil layl. Okay, the Salaf were described as soldiers by day, monks by night. We cannot have an imbalance. You don't want to be one of these people who are filled with anxiety because they're overworked. Nor do you want to be from those who made the opposite mistake and became monks by night and monks by day and you end up unemployed and useless. And what do these people do? They end up having a reaction towards religion because five years later, he's an unemployed guy and all of his friends are in medical school married. And he's unemployed. Why? He misplaced everything. He became a failure in life. So now what does he do? He turns and he rebels against the, the, the cause that made him realize that he's a failure in life. We have to be balanced. There's a time for ibadah and there's a time for work. And there's a time for these things to be shut down. Most of the youth today, they're suffering anxiety because they have no limits. They have no limits on their technology. There's no limit on their technology. And recently, uh, if you heard the news, a boy his grandma was waking him up. Everyone heard this story? His grandma woke him up for school. So he got so angry with her, she couldn't get him up. The mom came. And they both couldn't get the, the boy up. He got so angry, he walked, he marched up, got his gun, and shot them all. But he was so sleepy, he shot them and didn't get the heart. He didn't get any mortal wounds. They all were hospitalized and they're fine, they're alive. But he shot everyone in his household because of the, how they woke him up. So people are like, what kind of insanity is this? Well, one psychiatrist is saying, believe it or not, okay, this is sound crazy, but you can be sleep deprived so regularly on a, such a regular basis, you can actually behave this way. You can be crazy. And I'm telling you, these kids are now sleeping at two, three, four in the morning, gaming, okay? gaming and being online on a consistent basis. Just do it for four or five days, nine days in a row. You're going to be crazy. You're going to do something crazy. Okay? Either you become one of those who sleeps all day and games all night, complete deadbeat. <laughs> okay? <laughs> but if these kids have to go to school the next day, right? You got to wake up the next day. You're not going to be right. And this is one of the ways that shaitan is getting us, at the level of our sleep. And this is not a big deal. If this was not a big deal, if someone says it doesn't matter when you sleep, as long as you sleep, you, you're eight hours or you're five hours. No, it's important when you sleep. Allah Azza wa Jai would not have re revealed verses of Qur'an on this matter. Verses of Qur'an. Right? Ma'asha, Layla Libasa. Subata. 
multiple verses saying night is meant for sleeping, right? Day is meant for living. Multiple verses. Allah does not reveal anything except that it is uh, uh, important. And He doesn't name a surah except the subject matter is important. Surah Al-Layl, right? Surah Al-Layl. There's a surah called Nighttime. Nighttime has its haqq. So by having a type of clock, it would make much more sense to me if this 12-hour clock was 24 hours. So you could actually pinpoint, all right, from this block of time I'm doing this, this block of time I'm doing this, this block of time I'm doing this, generally speaking. We're not too rigid. You can't be too rigid. Your human, human beings can't be too rigid. Generally speaking, there's certain blocks of time for certain things, okay? And if you move one block of time, you must move the rest. But you can't stay up late and then keep your fajr routine. It's not going to work. If you have a routine of fajr, I wake up, I pray fajr, and I do this after fajr, this dhikr after fajr, okay? If you stay up late, you're not doing that. You're going to miss it, okay? You've got to have a general blockage of time, and our general sunnah is evening. And what do they call night? Uh, the night, the prelude to the night begins after asr, believe it or not. After asr, they start preparing for the night. Because we're humans, right? You can't have an on-off button. So you need a gray area. So the gray area that's turning into night comes after the asr prayer. Once you pray asr, in your mind, you should start unwinding everything. And then from Aisha, after Salat al-Aisha, is the time when you start readying yourself for sleep. Right? And then how do you know when the day, when you start up? Fajr. Right? Around Fajr time, and then give it to, we have Fajr all the way to Ishraq, to Duha time. It's going to be a mix between Fajr, Salah, maybe you get up for work, maybe you rest. Right? Okay? So this is how we, uh, and this thing is like, it's not some cockamamie 12-step system where some quote-unquote expert comes and gives you a detailed list at 7.05, do this. No, that never works, right? What works is what is simple. If the sun's up, it's day. If the sun's down, it's night. If Asr comes, the sun is setting, prepare. You can't just stop doing what you're doing. You have to prepare to wind everything down, like stop initiating calls, stop initiating texts, stop initiating work after Asr. Right? Okay. Then when it's time, then you can know to shut it down. And then when do you start it up again? When you have to. So that's Fajr. You got to go for Fajr. Right? That's when you initiate it. Run the motor up again. Okay? So this is how we operate things. By the prayer times and by the day and the night, knowing that Quran was revealed on this. We have made the day for living and the night for sleeping. All right? We'll take the Q&A, write them down, we'll take them before we end today. لا تترقب فروغ الأغيار فإن ذلك يقطعك عن وجود المراقبة له فيما هو مقيمك فيه Do not look forward to bring, being free okay, from anything okay? for that is indeed what cuts you off from vigilant attention to him in that very state he has assigned to you So one of the things that he's saying is that he's saying here is that um, don't look forward to the end of something because that is a distraction from what you're supposed to be doing now. Okay? Don't look forward to the end. We are actually a people of... Uh, the the, the Sufiya tend to be against multitasking. Well, they like things to be pure. Right? Which modern people multitask a lot. Right? But we like things to be pure. If you're doing a job, focus on that job. If you're taking a class, focus on that class. If you're doing, uh, talking to someone, what did the son of the prophet? When he talked to someone, he didn't look left or right. He didn't do something while talking to someone. Whenever the prophet talked to someone, he turned his whole chest facing that person and talked until they finished. And he never looked around, fidgeted, all right? Uh, showed that he doesn't want to be there or has done ever anything like this, right? 
So we're a type of people who are not really f supportive of m multitasking. It's not giving the hop the do of that thing. All right, you need to give everything its do. Okay, so do not look forward to the end of something because that is a distraction from what you're supposed to be doing now. And you don't know, all right, that what you're supposed to be doing now is your fat can come from there. Your benefit and your opening can come from that. Even if that's being sick, being in debt, being in a bad relationship, being in whatever, know that Allah has put you in this situation, accept it and work at it now until Allah relieves it. Some people are in a bad relationship. Some people don't get along with their grandparent or their mom or dad. You don't sit there, oh, I can't wait till I'm 21, I can't wait till I'm 24, right? No. It's going to happen anyway. No one's going to stop time. Just give the haq, have sabr now, okay? And don't keep looking at the clock. I mean, you look at jobs, some jobs, you got to look at the clock, okay? It's not moving. The more you look, the slower it moves. Just do what you have to do now. And you never know, you may discover a way to actually enjoy the, the state that you're in. Prisoners are like this. Pris prisoner, if you ask about prisoners, the worst time is when they're still in trial and they don't know what their fate is gonna be because they keep thinking, will I get out, will I not get out, will I get out, will I not get out. But when does he actually settle and his heart settles and he becomes in a routine? When he's sentenced, when you're sentenced, خلاص, I have no choice. So I'm here. Now that I'm here, now I can make a life for myself. Like all the, last year there was a report or whatever program on uh, Adnan the Sayyid from Baltimore and he's in jail, right? He's like, I have a life for myself. Actually, he said, this podcast has actually disturbed my routine because now you got me thinking of getting out again. I almost had no hope, so I had created a little life for myself here, right? So this is how you have to be. If you're in a state, you got to just be in that state and try to work it. You know, have sabr and see what kind of benefit you can have in that state. Don't say, I can't wait till it's over. Yeah. Okay. Postponing your deeds until you are free is one of the tricks of the nafs. Postponing your deeds. This is why we do in the dhikr, we do this exercise. That imagine yourself that you are khalas, like you're on your deathbed. Another meditation, imagine yourself, you've retired. Your kids are grown up and left the house. You are retired, 67-year-old man. How do you want to spend your time? How do you want to spend the last two years of your life? What do you want to do? The answer to that question is what you should be doing now, right? And everything else is merely what you have to do now. So I have to go to work, right? I have to take care of my responsibilities. But what you really would want yourself to be doing in the last two years of your life is what you should be doing in your free time now and empty your heart of everything else. I mean, what is the point of anything if you are willing to throw it out on your deathbed? If I'm willing to throw it out on my deathbed, right? That's the only thing that's important. And so how do, you, how do we all answer this question? We all answer this question, I hope I want to die with an empty heart from dunya. I don't want to have dunya in my heart. I don't want to have a thousand bank accounts. I don't want to have headaches of all the wealth that I've amassed. I don't want to have, be chasing some uh, material goal. Or I don't want to care about relation, my, my reputation. Are you going to be dying on your deathbed and worrying what people think about you? You're not going to, right? You're thinking about one thing. What have I done for Allah? Now it's my time to be with Allah, and you're going to start realizing, oh my gosh, I don't, I don't know Allah. I've never given this time. I've never given any effort to this subject, right? I don't know Allah. I wish I could go back 30 years and start over. 
then I wouldn't be chasing the company. I wouldn't be chasing this, chasing that, okay? Chasing, we're all chasing, right? This dhikr al okay, tells you what you need. And slowly, when you increase and do this, the gap between what comes to your mind when you do dhikr al and what you're actually living, that gap slowly shrinks slowly shrinks until you finally attain that, that you could die right now because I'm actually fulfilled. I'm doing what I would want to die upon. This is very important. This dhikr al is very important and this uh, procrastination, postponement is a huge trick from shaitan because you're postponing. You don't even know when you're going to die. All right? You don't know when you're going to die. When was, the, when was the last salat of janazah we had in this masjid? Does anyone remember who it was? It was, I believe, Alex. Who else went with me? Maybe Shaban went with me. Young man, not even 30 years old. Muslim man, not even 30 years old. Okay. He's a, that was the last janazah we did here. Okay. How about a couple of Ramadans ago? Did a janazah for a 37 year old. Okay. So there's no, you don't know when you're going to go. And there's just a, it's a trick of shaitan that say, okay, when you get old, because here's the problem. When you get old, you're stuck in your habits. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. You're stuck in your habits. Number two, you're tired. You're going to be exhausted. You're physically unfit. Now you're physically fit. So you need to do what you, how you want to do now, what you want to do now. And if you can't do it 100%, at least carve out part of the day. So visualize yourself that in part of the day, you are a 70 year old man that's about to die. Even if you do this for one hour of the day, right? We find we'll benefit from it and everything will change, okay? حقوق في الأوقات يمكن قضاؤها وحقوق الأوقات لا يمكن قضاؤها إذ ما من وقت يرد إلا ولله عليك فيه حق جديد وأمر أكيد فكيف تقضي فيه حق غيره وأنت لم تقض حق الله فيه It is possible to fulfill some obligations at times but it is impossible to fill the obligations of every moment. For there is no moment wherein Allah does not hold against you a new obligation or a definite matter. So how can you fulfill someone else's obligation when you have not fulfilled Allah's? And this is five minutes to break. Okay. There are two kinds of obligations upon the servant. The first is worship. The rights of Allah at fixed times such as praying and fasting. If you do not discharge these, okay, it is possible you know, to do them as qada. You can make up uh, prayer. You can make up uh, psalm. The second obligation concerns time, okay? But these obligations are at every moment, and there is no separate fixed set out time. If you miss this moment, you can never get it back. If you miss this moment, you can never get it back. Unlike Ramadan, if I travel in Ramadan, I got sick, I can make it up. But if I, get, if I waste time now, if I waste my free time and my health now, you cannot make that up. Okay? You can make up everything else except the wastage of time. Okay? The states of the human beings are of four types. You are either in ni'mah, or musibah. You're either receiving blessings from Allah or you are losing blessings from Allah. Okay? Or you are in obedience or you are in sin. Okay? If you are in ni'mah, if you're in ni'mah, you should be given shukr. If you are in musibah, you should be given sabr. If you are in ta'a, likewise, you should be given shukr. And if you are in ma'asiyah, you should be giving tawbah. I would differentiate it. I would say if you are in ni'mah, you should be giving sadaqah. If you are being blessed, 
you need to give out. If you're healthy, you need to do something beneficial with your body. Don't just serve yourself. Wallahi, we have a, such a self-serving culture, right? Such a self-serving culture. If you're doing, if you're in a state of health, you need to be serving others. If you have more knowledge, then you should be passing it on. If you have more wealth, you should be investing for someone else to benefit if, or, or, or donating. If you are in a state of um, physically, you can help people. You use your body for that reason, okay? If you're, you have resources at your fingertips, use those resources for others. If you're in ni'mah, you should be in doing sadaqah. If you are in musiba, you should be doing sabr, patience. If you're being struck, if you're sick, if you're poor, have patience. If you're in a bad situation, your job is to have patience. You cannot have patience later. You need to have patience now. Or you can't make it up. If you are in a state of obedience, you should be giving shukr. And if you are in the state of disobedience, you should be making tawbah. Okay? It is imperative that the servant observes the obligations of time. At every breath, he should be mindful of this duty. It is for this reason that the righteous scholars have said, a Sufi ibn Umm al waqt or Ibn al waqt In other words, he is per perpetually, perpetually engrossed in the discharge of the obligation of this moment. All right, of this moment. Okay. This is another thing that cult our culture is totally a global culture, a global world culture is really messed up in. I mean, nobody. Everyone is in, people are not engrossed in the moment that they're in, right? No one's engrossed in the moment that they're in. This is something totally lost. We're either busy recording it so much that we're not even enjoying it, right? We're either recording it that we're not even enjoying it. We really got to get our, ourselves under control here. The, the internet technology is a wild, wild west. And it's been running without rules for 10 years, 15 years, we need to start reining it in and having some, giving it some, some rules, right? Giving it some legislation, okay? Uh, you can't find people in the moment anymore. No one's in the moment. You either, you ruin the moment by trying to record the moment. You ruined it, right? You ruin the moment by trying to record the moment. Uh, or you're not finding any benefit and immediate satisfaction in this moment, so you recourse down to the mobile phone, right? So this is, uh, as you see here, he has an, um, two more hikmahs we'll do and we'll finish this chapter, this issue of time. The part of your life that has gone by is irreplaceable and that which has arrived is priceless, okay? Can't put a price on it. No compensation can ever be offered for man's time that has expired. Therefore, the time that one obtains at present is priceless. The entire earth with all its possessions cannot buy a moment that has passed, okay? Which has the potential to bring everlasting happiness for the one who uses his time wisely. It is precisely for this reason that the pious predecessors treasured their breathing, taking a constant reckoning of every breath. Never would they destroy a single moment. According to a hadith, the moment that a servant spends in forgetfulness will be a cause of regret for him. But at that time in the future, once he has passed away, remorse will be of no avail. Uh, one of the things that they say is, Today, your, your state today is a result of how you used your time in the past, okay? And so therefore, your future is not going to be by planning for it, it's by what you are doing now, all right? How you're making use of your time now is going to indicate your future. Uh, take so, forget someone who's still young. They don't understand, but they haven't had a chance to live yet. Let's take a 40-year-old man. A 40-year-old man, what is his state today with his job, 
his wife, and his kids. It is all dependent upon what he did in the past decade. If he worked hard and neglected his kids, he's going to have a good job, no relationship with his kids. Right? If he was mean and nasty to his wife, he shouldn't expect a pleasant marriage. Right? Whatever you have now, it is only a result of your yesterdays. All of your yesterday moments compiled. So the intelligent person, he doesn't think, sit there being worried about tomorrow or being sad about the past. He should be doing something useful today, something of value today. And the last hikmah, it would be disappointing, very disappointing, or a huge regret. If you find yourself free from distractions, then you do not use your time for suluk towards Allah Azza wa Jal. And if you have, if you were to have a few obstacles, then not move on to Him. Basically, he's saying the worst and the biggest fool amongst the people is someone who has free time. He's got free time and he doesn't use it for tasawwuf. This is the biggest fool. Biggest fool. There is a room on Yom Al Qiyamah, there's a place, a space for the Shabab, the youth who use their time, their free time in suluk and ibadat of Allah Azza wa Jal. There's a special place and there are many from the Bani Israel and there are even more from the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When everyone's suffering on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, they will be ushered in a special room. They will be ushered in a special place in which they can pray and they could wait and receive their jazat, their reward, okay? They will be made youth again. Everyone is, Yom Al in Jannah is 33, we know that. But in Yom Al Qiyamah, you will rise up in your best of states or your worst of states. So your best of state, if your best moment was that time, your whole life, someone's entire life trajectory is based on what he did from the age of 15 to 25. And mashallah, we have some people studying, doing dhikr, doing tahajjud, avoiding wrong from the age of 15 to 25. Every good that he does afterwards is due to this investment that he put in the age of 15 to 25. And that's why Allah will resurrect them as youth. He will resurrect them as youth because that was where you, the game was over. You, you won the game in the first inning. You don't need to show the highlights of the ninth inning, right? You won the game 11-3, but you scored eight runs in the first inning. All you need to talk about is the first inning. Everything else doesn't matter. Right? It's all the results of the first inning. Okay? Likewise, mashallah, these shabab, and some are the opposite. Some are the opposite. Failures in life. A'udhu billah. Lost. Don't be a failure in life. Right? You, and we know what to do. Force yourself to do it and ask, oh Allah, make me sincere. If I have doubts, ask Allah to remove them. If I have shakiness, so ask Allah to remove it. You think Allah is not in control of your heart? Then you must not believe in Allah, right? If I have shakiness, I ask Allah, remove the shakiness. If I have, I'm confused, I don't know what to do. Ask Allah to remove it. And spend your youth serving, all right? The youth should be divided into a couple parts, all right? A couple parts. If you have someone in Shabbat, in their youth, they're uh, even giving one quarter of their time to Allah, this is huge. It's huge, okay? Humongous. But if you have youth who are lost, you have to, we have to make du'a for them. We have to make a big du'a for them. And you don't know them. You don't know when things are going to turn around. Because we have like, uh, and we'll close with this, like you got a type of, like a old, back in the olden days, if they wanted to fling a rock, what did they do? They took a rock, they put it in like a rubber band, they pull it all the way back, then they let go. Some people, this is their trajectory, that they're gonna regress, 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 but they don't realize that that regress is gonna lead to something great, right? They keep regressing 
for a wisdom. Allah knows that some people need to be in darkness before they can appreciate the light. Other people immediately attracted to the light. So don't pass a judgment when you see someone regressing because even his regress may be his way to progress. Everyone's different. Like a cheetah can run fast. A slingshot is also fast. The cheetah doesn't need to go backwards, right? But the slingshot needs to go backwards in order to go forward. The cheetah doesn't do that, right? So don't uh, pass a judgment. But however, the youth have to take to, you know, give their time to Allah Azza wa Jal. And um, if your parents are sort of dragging you, then you should be grateful because at least you have good habits. At least you have good habits and you're not doing something bad. All right, so this was this chapter on time. And this being the first of the month, we are uh, dividing it back again. So after our break and salah, Shafi fiqh, Hanafi fiqh, everyone else here for Ulum al-Quran. Yes? Thank <clears throat> you.